This is our second video in our series on vertebrate diversity. In this video, we're going to focus on the subphylum vertebrata, class Agnatha, chondrichthys, and osteichthys, the fish. In our last video, we introduced the whole subphylum vertebrata. In this video, we're going to zoom in on the three classes of fish. The first thing we need to look at is the class, or the yeah, the class Agnatha, the vertebrates that lack a jaw. The term Agnatha, a meaning lacking, nath means jaw. These are the jawless fish. Sometimes they're referred to as cyclostomes or round mouth. And if you look at a picture of this this fish, a, a lamprey or a hagfish, you can see why this is a very appropriate name. These Agnathans are primitive fish in in many ways. Um, they, uh, from a habit, from a um, lifestyle standpoint, are often uh, scavengers or parasites. We see in this picture over here how it's attached onto this other fish and is uh, feeding off the other fish's body. And they have these pretty gruesome-looking mouths here to um, to do that with. Um, from a skeletal system standpoint, we're very primitive. Uh, even though we're in the subphylum vertebrata, we retain the notochord. So here's our very f our only exception to the uh, idea that vertebrates uh, have vertebrae. In fact, the agnathans do not develop a vertebrae, but they do have the skull, which is part of our axial skeleton, which is kind of our um, determinant for why something would be a vertebrate. And it's made of cartilage, so very limited skeleton. Now, other ways that these are pretty um, primitive uh, vertebrates is they lack paired fins. We see this uh, long dorsal fin and a tail fin, but there are no fins coming off the sides uh, at like appendages. So they, ha they lack these paired fins. They also have multiple gill slits. We can see in this picture more than one gill slit. And in this picture over here, I'm going to pick up the red pen here, uh, multiple gill slits, and that's a primitive feature. Uh, then we'll see the number of gill slits reduce as we move through the fish. So these long slender body and all, another primitive feature is that they lack scales. Now if we're going to move on from the agnathans and move down our other branch, then obviously then we have to discuss the development of a jaw. The nathostome, nath means jaw and stome means mouth, are the vertebrates that have a jaw. So let's stop for a moment and briefly discuss where the jaw might have come from. The idea is that the bony gill arch, which could be cartilage or bone, these arches that support the gills, um, evolved over time into the jaw, that the foremost, uh, the frontmost of these gill arches moved forward and became what we know today to be a jaw. So we went from agnatha, lacking a jaw, to the nathostomes, the jawed mouth uh, animals. So if we do evolve uh, jaws, then we need to move on to the animals that have jaws. And so then the question is, what type of skeleton, cartilage or bone? And we're going to go down this route, the cartilage, and talk about the class chondrichthys, or cartilage fish. Chondri means cartilage. Ichthys means fish. These are the cartilage fish. So an example of a cartilage fish is a shark. Uh, obviously have jaws, they made a movie about it, but also the stingrays, the skates, and the uh, chimera, and the, the ratfish. Um, but these fish have skeletons composed entirely of cartilage. They do have the complete endoskeleton with the skull and the vertebrae and the ribs. Um, they have a well-developed nervous system. We know that sharks smell very well and that their eyesight uh, might be limited, depends on the type of shark, and some of them have good eyesight. They also have the ability to um, have a good sense of, of feel and uh, kind of pick up electrical fields around them too. We know some interesting sensory structures in their snout. Um, when you look at the nostrils on a fish, whether it be a shark or any other type of fish, and I ask you what nostrils are for, please don't tell me that they're for breathing because fish uh, have gills and so the nostrils must then be for smell. Uh, one of the interesting things when we look at the sharks is comparing them to the agnathans. Obviously, we have a jaw. Uh, we also have paired fins. Uh, we have you know, a pair of fins at the front. There's also at the back a little pair of fins uh, called um, uh, anal fins. Um, and they use this, uh, the dorsal fin to help uh, keep them in a straight line. And of course, their very powerful uh, caudal fin or tail fin helps uh, propel them forward. So these paired appendages, though, is a, a new feature. Um, however, they are still a little primitive in that they have multiple gill slits uh, down the side here. Uh, 
And when we look at the uh, the sharks um, or the chondrichthys, they have interesting scales. They have very small scales, it's almost like sandpaper when you feel the skin of a shark. Uh, these scales are small and triangular in shape. They're called uh, placoid scales. I'm going to grab a highlighter here. Placoid scales. And they're triangular in shape. So I want to ask, what else on a shark has this triangular shape? Think about that for a minute. See what you come up with. Yeah, how about the teeth? Those are triangular in shape. And the, uh, the suggestion is that the teeth are just uh, modified scales, and they certainly have multiple rows of teeth. It's hard to see in this picture, but they have uh, multiple rows, and if one tooth falls out, the next one comes up from behind it, uh, overlapping very much like the scales do. But going back to scales, let's talk about the functions. These overlapping scales um, provide a pretty good water barrier, and they actually prevent water loss. As this uh, shark is in salt water, it would be easy for its water from the inside to diffuse out uh, into the uh, salty water, and so we don't want that to happen. I just jumped pages there for a minute. Let me try to find my way back. Um, and we don't want to lose our water uh, to the outside, so these scales prevent that water loss. Okay. A couple other things about the uh, the sharks or the chondrichthys and skates and rays is that their body density is usually the, more than the water that they're in. So if they stop swimming, they tend to sink, uh, which is, if you were in deep water could be a problem, but in shallow water probably not too much of a problem. Um, also, the, uh, the myth that if sharks stop swimming that they drown, that they have to stay moving to keep gas exchange going as water goes uh, into their mouth. Uh, into their body and then out the gills uh, across which gas exchange occurs. And they can stay still for, for short amounts of time, but they do tend to need to uh, keep moving. And that brings us to um, osteichthys. So if we go back here, we have our vertebrate, and we have a jaw, and we have a skeleton, but it's made of bone. So the question is, do we have legs or not? And if we have a bony skeleton with a jaw and no legs, then we have the osteichthys. And oste means bone, and ichthys means fish. So we have our bony fish. And these are the perch and the trout and the goldfish and the salmon and tuna and most of the other fish that you could probably name. Uh, Well-developed nervous systems. We know that fish have a very good sense of smell um, and eyesight uh, depends on the, uh, the type of fish. Certainly the tropical fish with their bright colors and very clear water, uh, vision is a much more important sense for them. But a fish that lives like a catfish maybe in a dark murky lake, uh, vision wouldn't be, doesn't need to be good and, and wouldn't be any good anyway because they can't um, see very far. Um, hearing, we don't have any external ear openings but we have the internal ear structures for balance and that can pick up vibration in the water. But the other interesting um, sensory system is the lateral line, which is sensitive to pressure changes. And let's look at a different picture here. When we look at this fish, we can see this line right here alongside their body, and that's the lateral line. This lateral line is sensitive to pressure changes, which uh, tells the fish a couple things. One, it gives the fish information about depth. The deeper it goes, the more pressure its body is under, but also can give it information about movement nearby. If something nearby uh, the fish moves, it sends a compression wave through the water and it can feel that pressure. You see this in action when you see a school of fish swimming and they all turn at the same time. It's a, they feel the water moving around them. They almost move in unison due to the, the being able to sense that water movement through the lateral line. That's kind of an interesting little feature. Obviously, the bony fish have gills. They have four bony gill arches that support highly folded gills with blood vessels running through them. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. But they're covered by uh, an operculum. And let me show you a different picture uh, that shows this in better detail. Here's a, a man lifting up the operculum. This is a flap that covers it. So we only have one gill slit, only one opening. But inside there, there are, are multiple uh, bony arches to support the gills. In fact, there are four gill arches, and we're going to talk more about those gills. But we only have a single gill arch, and that's a, a change. Obviously, we have a closed circulatory system. That's not the issue with the circulatory system. But we are going to talk about the fish's circulatory system in, in general uh, for both uh, the, all the fish, really. And I'll, I'll draw a diagram in just a moment, so I'll hold off on that talk for a, a second. Um, we have two, a pair of kidneys to um, get rid of the nitrogenous waste, the metabolic waste, and help us maintain a salt to water balance of the blood, which is important in both fresh and saltwater fish. Um, uh, the osteichthys uh, usually exhibit external fertilization, 
Uh, that's in contrast to the sharks, which some of the sharks show internal fertilization, where the the male puts the the male gamete inside the female body. But in most of the bony fish, or in all the bony fish, the female releases eggs, and males release sperm on top of the eggs outside the body, and then the the eggs develop outside the body. Uh, we have a skeletal system made of bone. We already said that because they're bony fish. Uh, the other interesting thing here. Um, I don't want to run out of time, is the swim bladder. The swim bladder, if we look at the internal structure, is a structure uh, inside the fish. It's uh, connected, actually attached uh, right beside the um, the intestine, and gases move into this bladder and can fill up or, or deflate, and it gives the fish a buoyancy. It lets the fish float. So if your goldfish stops swimming in its tank, it doesn't sink to the bottom. It doesn't float to the top. Uh, if it does, uh, Goodbye bye goldfish, but um, it allows the fish to kind of float at a constant depth, and by changing the amount of gas in the swim bladder, it changes the depth at which it, it'll float. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the internal anatomy of the fish, but we do have a fairly complex um, uh, animal here. Now we're getting to be a pretty complex vertebrate. We have accessory organs of the uh, digestive system, like the liver and the gallbladder. We are going to talk, like I said, about the circulatory system of the fish, and if we have time, I want to talk about uh, the countercurrent gas exchange in the in the gills of the fish. One last feature I want to look at in the bony fish is the scales. Um, like the chondrichthys, they have scales, unlike the uh, agnathans, which lack scales. But in the bony fish, the scales are shaped differently than they are in the chondrichthys. Instead of the triangular-shaped placoid scales, they have these kind of large D-shaped uh, cycloid scales but they serve the same function. These overlapping scales uh, make a good water barrier to help keep their, their water in. Now as we go to this page, we have some general fish uh, information applies to basically all fish. Uh, obviously, we'll talk more about the gills in a moment, like I said, with the countercurrent gas exchange, uh, the digestive system we don't need to talk about. But I want to talk more about the circulatory system. Uh, we'll point out here that, again, most fish have external fertilization with the exception of some sharks. Uh, all fish hatch from eggs. Some of the sharks, it looks like a live birth, um, but really the female shark is, has eggs. She just holds them in her body, so when they're born, it looks like a live birth, but all, all fish hatch from eggs. And fish are ectotherms, meaning that their body temperature is dependent on the external temperature, the temperature of the water. And this is a, a not as big a deal for fish as it might be for a terrestrial animal, because large bodies of water change temperature very slowly, as we learned about in our properties of water video. Now I want to talk about the fish's circulatory system. And the reason I want to talk about it uh, is because we're going to be contrasting it to the circulatory system of the amphibians and, um, and reptiles and birds and mammals. Uh, the fish have a, a heart, a two-chambered heart. Uh, heart is just a muscular pump, and the two chambers of the fish heart are called the atrium and the ventricle. Blood is received into the heart, uh, into the atrium, and you think of the atrium as the entrance to a building. It's often called an atrium. And so the blood comes into the atrium, and it is pumped from the atrium into the ventricle, and then the ventricle sends the blood on. You can remember this because A and uh, V, it's alphabetical order. And the blood goes from the ventricle, it gets pumped uh, to the gills, and it's at the gills where the blood gets oxygenated and we can drop off car carbon dioxide. And so this oxygen-rich blood, which leaves the gills, goes out and circulates throughout the whole body. Now this is a schematic diagram, so my boxes represent, you know, in this case, this is, represents the whole body, which obviously is many blood vessels and many capillary beds and many organs. And then when the body uh, is done with the blood, it sends it back to the heart, and it pumps it back to the gills, and we have our circulatory system. Now we can draw in the gills oxygenating the blood, making it red. We use red to represent blood that's high in oxygen. And then out in the body, it drops off that oxygen. And so that oxygen-poor blood, which we usually draw in blue in circulatory systems, returns from the body oxygen-poor, enters into the atrium, which sends the blood onto the ventricle, which sends the blood onto the gills to then pick up oxygen again. Now this circulatory system has a heart with uh, two chambers only, an atrium and a ventricle, and a single loop. I point this out because we're going to contrast this to the circulatory systems in other animals. Now I've run out of time to talk about the countercurrent gas exchange in the gills. We're certainly going to talk about that in class, and I may make a really short video on it. And if I do, I'll link it right here. 
but let's also briefly talk about some of the unusual fish and the hints that we get from these fish as to kind of how we may have moved uh, from water onto land. We have our lobed finned fish, which have these little fleshy arms. This is the coelacanth, which is the only known existent or uh, extant version of the lobed finned fish, and the idea is that they may have given rise to the early amphibian. Uh, we also have some fish that are called lung fish with simple lungs, and we, we know that these mud skippers can exist on land for short periods of time, and they use their fins to walk across. And so it's the idea that we could have moved from here onto land. One of the things you might want to do in review is to kind of do a compare and contrast with the Agnathans, Chondrichthys, Nostichthys uh, using this chart right here. So pause the video and write that one down and uh, uh, be ready for some kind of um, uh, evaluation on this video.